vaccine or whatever that they're engaging with into the world, right? You're like, you don't have to get online to see what climate change is happening. Maybe you lost power, maybe your neighbors did. We watched, um, watched the storm roll through the city and um, looked at how the maps we've seen of raising, rising sea levels were coming true, right? And who was vulnerable to that? Um, that's one of the things about um, Mother Nature being here with us tonight is that everyone's vulnerable, right? We're all together on this planet. But there's also some of us that are more vulnerable than others. And you can see the people who, you know, don't have enough money to stock up 10 days worth of food if their power goes out. Um, or who are living in public housing where the city has not seen fit to return for the water and heat despite the impending cold, right? And um, these are things that are being repeated outside of New York City, all over the world. It's some of the things that are at risk um, with the expansion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we're in the room to discuss tonight. Um, and it is part of that. Into what we really want you to take away is to see how it's all connected. Right? It's not just about one little policy um, or a particular expertise. Right? We have economists in the room, or we have nutritionists in the room. It's really about the, the fabric of, of coexistence on this planet. So, um, I'll offer, I'm sure, a few more <laughs> comments later. We're happy to see um, Adam in the room. In fact, yeah, we're going to give Adam a few moments to set up, uh, but that means that you will get a little video <coughs> if necessary uh, a little later, but we're actually going to start right away. Um, forgive me for looking at my phone, uh, but I'm, this is not checking my text. I'm going to actually tell you about our first speaker here tonight. If you were on the Facebook page, you might have seen uh, the link to his article. He's an economist, he's a human rights activist. Um, his name is Pete Novak. Yes? Did I say it right? So lag. So lag. I'm hoping I would remember before it got to yeah. since my phone was slower than my brain tonight. Anyway, um, so Pete So lag has agreed to introduce the Trans-Pacific Partnership in kind of broad sweeping terms so we know exactly what's going on to understand the more specific things that we'll hear from some of our later speakers. Um, sorry. Wow, that was a long... All right, so Pete Zolak is an activist, essayist, poet, and photographer. We love it if you close the poem. Um, we've been working for over two decades in these issues, so he's definitely going to be able to paint the big picture for us here this evening. Um, we've worked specifically doing human rights work with Amnesty International, worked with the National People's Campaign, New York Workers Against Fascism, the Brooklyn Green, Green Party of New York, and the No Spray Coalition. Anyone in the room affiliated with any of those groups? We want to thank you for sharing Pete with us this evening and invite him to the stage. Okay, some of you have heard this phrase, NAFTA on steroids. Yeah. And that, yeah, a lot of you are saying, yeah. And that's what this is about. What it's about is taking the North America Free Trade Agreement and saying, that isn't enough. We haven't gotten sufficient corporate control. We haven't attacked labor. We haven't attacked the environment, etc., etc. So this is going to be that to the new base for something even bigger and even worse. And that's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership is all about. And that's why this is being done in secret. This is actually not new. This has been negotiated for at least four years now. It started at the very end of the Bush II administration. But really, it's the Obama administration that's behind us. Now, there may be someone, and I don't want to, you know, I hate to dispel, you know, what people like to believe, but... And then I bet that there's someone here who thinks the Obama administration is going to save us from this. I'm sorry, that isn't going to happen. And if you're thinking, the Democrats will save us from this. Well, that's not going to happen either. The only person, the only people who are going to save us from this is all of us. In fact, it's the Obama administration that not only is the driving force behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's also the entity among all the now 11 countries that are negotiating this around the Pacific Rim that are pushing through the most harshest, the toughest and, uh, rules, the rules that go even further beyond NAFTA. And it's a really scary thing. Now what's interesting about this, this is intended to supplant NAFTA. 
and it's what they refer to as scalable. It's just kind of one of these funny, funny words. And what it means is the countries that agree to this or get dragooned into approving it by the United States if we want to be really accurate about this. Uh, this will become a non-negotiable final path. This is it. So any other country that in the future wants to join it, they'll be welcome to join it. Oh, sure, to get rid of all environmental laws and other kind of pesky laws like that. Oh, we'd only be too happy for that, of course. But no negotiations. No further notifications. They have to join it in as is. And that's what they mean by scalable. And what's interesting about this is not even Canada and Mexico were in this. Mex the United States was negotiating this with a variety of countries. There are uh, other advanced capitalist countries like Japan, kind of uh, uh, capitalist countries a little further down in the global pecking order like Chile. Uh, then you have countries who are wholly dependent on resource extraction like Malaysia and then very poor uh, still developing countries like Vietnam. So you've got a whole range of countries on the whole global pecking, capitalist pecking order involved in this. And the reason for that is the resource extraction, corporate dominance, that's what this is all about. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, it will be more, if there's any dispute under this law, it'll have to be, uh, uh, It'll have to be resolved in what's known as the ICSID, and if I can remember this correctly, it's the International Center for Investor State Disputes. And it sounds like kind of a kind of a you know, neutral kind of sounding thing, but what this is, this is this is actually an arm of the World Bank, and we know just how much the World Bank thinks of things like the environment and labor laws and etc. And the judges who staff these bodies aren't even judges, they're actually corporate lawyers. And each country that signs on to this, and uh, this are involved in some of the existing, not only NAFTA, but many other existing trade agreements, they make a ruling and now becomes a precedent. And in fact, there's a couple of others besides ICSID, one of which is the London Court of Arbitration. And interestingly, there's a now a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Ecuador, obviously put in place before the current Ecuadorian government uh, took office, when there was a neoliberal regime there. And uh, there was a tax dispute uh, around, I think Chevron, but one of the big oil companies that operates there, I think, I think it was Chevron. And what they did is, the oil company argued that, that Ecuador's uh, tax policies uh, was discriminatory, that basically any attempt at increasing their taxation was an unfair compensation uh, of taking away of, of, the, of their investor rights, i.e. their right to make the highest amount of profit regardless of any human considerations. And the judge, who was a corporate lawyer, actually says, oh yeah, sounds good to me. So that's now a precedent. So if any one of these bodies, there's one other besides the London and the ICSID, I can't remember its name, but if any of these bodies make a ruling, then it becomes a precedent, and now we have a new floor, or it just a new floor this way, because for our point of view, it's, 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 getting, it's getting worse and worse. So what the Obama administration is doing is they're negotiating this in, in secret, they're strong arming the other, the other partners, even countries like Australia and New Zealand, and actually have, you know, somewhat reasonable uh, standards go uh, protections either for generic drugs, to make drugs uh, uh, available on a cheaper basis for people with AIDS or other life threatening diseases, environmental laws, all of this kind of stuff will be under direct attack under under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even more so, even more so than NAFTA, because what they're going to do is they're taking NAFTA as a starting point. They're going to implement NAFTA, but they're implementing a whole series of other things. Basically, what this is going to come down to is that any law, any regulation, any attempt by any government that does anything that will, in the eyes of the corporation involved with this that decides, hey, that's going to affect my profits. I'm going to take a hit in my profits. That now constitutes an investor right. Investor rights now transcend human rights, mother nature, everything. And the requirement, the requirement will be that the uh, ruling will have to be that, no, nope, you violated investor rights. That law's got to go. And think about that. The job of corporations codified in law will be the maximization of private corporate profit. 
I mean, that's already the tendency under capitalism because the you know, the inner workings of capitalism accrue more and more power to the biggest corporations. They're able to use their power to really bend the rule of governments and, and do a lot of things to twist the rules their way. That isn't enough for them. That isn't enough for them. Now this is going to be actually codified in law. We're going to go beyond actual market relations to, to actual legal law. And not even, con not even the United States Congress knows what's in this. There's no environmental group. There's no public interest group. There's no grassroots group that knows what's in this because it's all been done in secret. Now all the corporations involved in this, they all have a seat at the table. And the governments of these 11 countries, they have a seat at the table. And I imagine many of their corporations also have a seat at the table. No one else does. No one else has a seat. The only reason we know anything at all about it is because this, uh, Public Citizen and a couple other groups got small pieces of this they managed to get their hands on and post it online. And you can see some of this. Now, we've only seen a small fraction of this. We don't even know what else is in it. We don't even have any idea. I mean, we've got a concept of what's coming down. And remember, it's the Obama administration. The Obama administration is the entity that's the leading driving force behind this. The Obama administration is not only not going to save us, they're the ones who want to implement this. They're the ones who want to do it in secret because they know there'll be a huge outcry. So we understand what our task is, is basically to stop this. Now there's all kinds of things of the speakers coming after me are going to tell you about uh, uh, health issues, environmental issues, and some of the other issues that's so specific to that, even with the whole whole evening, we still won't be able to get to nearly all the issues around this. So I really recommend everybody go out and read as much as you can. There's a number of good articles on there. Uh, on, I write the Systemic Disorder blog about the economic crisis. And if you go onto the front page, on the right-hand side, you'll see a column that says Most Read Posts. You'll see a headline about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That'll give you a broad overview, and there's several links to several other to several organizations that are doing some very good work on this, and that will give you uh, uh, that that will uh, help help get us all up to up to speed. That's uh, systemicdisorder.wordpress.com. I'll repeat that once more because I'm almost I'm almost out of time here. Uh, there, there's just so much to, to go to, to go into this. <laughs> there's just so much to go into this, uh, and, and we really can't stress enough. Uh, uh, that I, I think our first task, in, in, in my opinion, I'm uh, speaking strictly for myself here, I don't purport to speak for anyone else here, uh, and I believe me, there's some very knowledgeable speakers you're going to be hearing from momentarily, is that I, I think our first task is just to let everybody know what's going on. Not that many people know about it. I mean, even I was vaguely aware of it. I know somewhere out there in the ether this was being talked about, and then when I went and did some research, uh, boy, it gets scarier and scarier about that. So uh, uh, this is this is the real thing. There there will be no more democracy. We're, corporate domination, governments acting only to enhance corporate profits, human life meaning nothing, being worthless. You know, we always talk about this in the abstract, and the workings of the capitalist system tend to lend itself for that. But there's always cracks and seams, and there's little places for us to push back. If this gets implemented, and this gets implemented to the full, the way the corporation is pushing this, uh, uh, and with the full backing of the Obama administration, I just can't stress that enough. Don't get their way on this. We're going to lose a lot of those scenes. We're going to be so much worse off. We're going to be so much weaker. We're going to have such a greater struggle. So the time for action is now. I don't know when this is coming on. Because everything is a secret. It could be tomorrow they'll pop this out. They could be negotiating for many months to come. We don't really know. So, uh, action. Action is what's needed. Action by us. Thank you so much. Um, I want to I wanna stress the fact that there was that it in that statement that you just made. You know, and that's if we don't come together, and if we're not visionary, and if we don't change things block by block, right? It can be really depressing to come to these conversations, right? You might want to stay home and watch Netflix, 
Um, unless we really believe that the, the collective creative power that we have already in our hands is far stronger than whatever they've been able to accumulate through their really like emperor, Star Wars kind of ways of um, you know thinking about hate and division and violence and greed and fear um, because you don't have to be about that. None of us have to be about that. Um, it's a really great thing to realize in the morning that you actually can be part of that different world that we're creating. Um, today was a great day. Obviously it was snowing for a few of us in New York. I'm not sure if it was snowing in D.C. Um, but there was an action happening in D.C. of people that are already bringing the TPP and the uh, risks that, that that has to life and death of people across the planet, um, bringing that to the media and to the Congress and do direct action in Washington, D.C. It's really um, one of the most exciting things about the anti-free trade movement is that it's not just about being anti, right? It's about creating the world that we want. And when they go after everyone at the same time, right? Like, they never learn. They think that, I mean, obviously, like, everyone knows divide and conquer, and they're certainly going hard on divide and conquering. But then at the same time, they want to pass new policies that attack workers, they attack indigenous people, they attack children, they attack elders, they attack people that breathe, people that drink, people that eat. And all of a sudden, we're all on the same team. So whereas before we felt divided, we felt like we had different values at play, um, we're all working together on this one. Um, and so there's people that have been in the movement for a long time, people that come, like we talked about earlier, to the table for different reasons. We have with us today Amanda Love, who is the uh, political organizer, director. Um, yeah, director of advocacy. Director of advocacy. I gotta check my notes next time. Um, for the African Services Committee, uh, which does direct work with African immigrants here in New York City, and is also involved in the local and global movement for access to medicine and access to healthcare, uh, one of the things that's on the line. Um, so, Amanda, I'd like to invite you up. Um, do you want to be over here already? She's going to play piano? Yeah, <laughs> I was wishing someone had brought a soundtrack. Next time we're bringing a DJ, at least for the intro. That works. If I can. This might work. It might work. Okay. Is this messing with the camera or anything? You good? Just thinking that the other day, TPP, Trans Civil Action, NAFTA, the Trade Union, they sound so innocent. Like they've used a consultant from the hallmark or something to come up with a name. Think like a partnership or something, you know, that's a benefit to us or a deal, a real deal. No. So, um, good evening. My name's Amanda. And like I said, I am Director of Advocacy at Active Services. Uh, CBO is just up here in Harlem on 127. Um, and we serve African in immigrant community with a range of social services, but our main focus is health, uh, more specifically HIV and AIDS. Um, we also operate for testing and treatment services in Ethiopia. Um, I also um, sit on the board of Health Gap, um, whose hat I'm wearing. I literally wear tonight. Um, Health Gap is, a, uh, is an organization um, that works on access to global uh, treatment for people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, so what I want to do tonight in just uh, a few short minutes is um, tell you a little bit about Health Gap, about what we do. Um, um, thanks Peter for the for the broad overview of TPP that saved me a lot of slides. Um, and how the TPP impacts people's access to life saving medications and in our case um, HIV AIDS drugs. So Health Gap International AIDS Activist Organization. Um, we've been working on the issues of access to medicines and against so called free trade agreements since nineteen ninety nine. Um, we're a strong believer in direct action, organizing and strategic policy making, and we engage, so we do the inside-outside, where, um, where at those 
at the table at WO with WHO, UN AIDS, um, with PEPFAR, which is uh, um, originally uh, Bush administration's uh, bilateral agreement with a number of developing countries on access to medications. But we also <coughs> feel that as importantly, if not more importantly, uh, uh, is our outside strategies in organizing communities to uh, participate in direct action to let um, those with the power know who really has the power. Um, what uh, Tali uh, was just referencing about an action um, we're really excited about that, that went so well today. Um, at about half past 12 this afternoon, uh, seven AIDS activists um, took over the office of the Senate leader, um, Boyner, um, and got naked and um, had gotten naked and um, I, well yeah, they're online I mean hopefully you'll be going you'll be um, eventually uh, I, don't, I don't know if I know any of you personally but hope it's, they're going around Facebook already um, but folks had um, painted on their bodies um, stop uh, cuts to AIDS fund PEPFAR, fund the global fund, fund HOPWA, these are all an ac uh, acronyms uh, within global and domestic um, AIDS programs. Um, but basically, um, yeah, got naked, chained themselves together, um, were able to hold down for about 25 minutes, um, got a load of press, it was great press. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. And um, AP have picked it up, which uh, as we all know is like the golden fleece. Um, so hopefully you'll be seeing it in not if not in your um, the blogs that you uh, that you look at, but um, in the papers. Um, but uh, crazily, I just found out that the three um, there were three women and four men, and just the women were arrested. Yeah, they said um, you know they gave them a good 15, 20 minutes, and they said if you don't um, stop, you know you'll be arrested for indecent indecent exposure. Um, folks reckon that they got all their um, their photo ops, their nude spreads, and um, they were getting dressed actually in the hallway. And um, the cops picked up three women. Well, actually, they picked up one woman and handcuffed her. And uh, so, uh, as we do direct um, action activists in solidarity, the two other women went with them. So not just one person's left in jail. So the three women went off to jail and hopefully they'll be out around now if not first thing in the morning. So that was this morning's action um, organised in part by, uh, by Health Gap. So um, uh, what do we do? Our current campaign is to dismantle barriers to access to meds. Um, the PEPFAR and the Global Fund I mentioned, you've heard about this fiscal bluff. Um, that was all part of today's action where we're looking at threatened cuts to Medicaid which will affect people living with HIV and AIDS um, as well as supportive services around housing uh, for people living with AIDS uh, and of course the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, these deals uh, include enhanced rather than reduced access to medicines as Peter said and we're also working on a legislative campaign you may have heard of the Robin Hood tax which has really taken off in um, the UK um, and now I believe it's seven, seven other European countries have taken it on um, which is basically a small uh, tax on Wall Street to be able to fund not only AIDS programs worldwide but climate change, environmental um, job, uh, job creation. It's a, it's a beautiful idea. It is gaining some traction. Actually, the Democratic National Committee in California just signed on to it last week. Um, so this isn't going to happen overnight, but it's looking good. So if you hear of that Robin Hood tax or the financial transaction tax, it's a good thing. Because, um, you know, they're always telling us, yeah, you know, it all sounds great, but we don't have the money. This is a way to create. Uh, economists have reckoned up to about $350 billion per year, which is just like, it, it's, it's amazing. Okay, next. Um, 
So um, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with um, the AIDS issues around the AIDS pandemic, but um, uh, a very important um, uh, uh, trial um, released their results last year where it's scientifically proven now that within 30 years we could end the AIDS pandemic. I say pandemic, not end AIDS specifically, but as an epidemic, a worldwide epidemic. And the, the, the main plank on that is that if medicines were cheaper. Um, the trial uh, proved that if, every, if people were on, uh, had access to, to ARVs, antiretroviral medications, um, it brought down the community load, um, like the cohort, you know, thousands in this cohort, by not, the, the risk of transmission of HIV in these folks was reduced by 96%. This was unheard of and just like rang bells everywhere. So you may have heard uh, Hillary Clinton, we had the AIDS um, conference in DC this past summer. Um, Clinton and Obama talking about the AIDS-free generation um, this is on the back of uh, that particular clinical trial. So we can end AIDS, but only with cheaper meds, um, and meaning generic medications. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is the newest, biggest barrier to this access to medicines. Um, it will control all aspects of trade, as, as you know, so that countries might be willing to agree to limit their access uh, to medications if it means that they're able to import and export goods. Um, so what does it mean by access to medicines? Um, essentially in developing countries it's primarily dependent on price as I said. Patent brand name drugs are usually much more, or always much more expensive than generic drugs. Uh, they get to keep their monopoly, the patent drugs, for up to 20 years. Um, and with the, the, uh, when we first got AIDS drugs it was, uh, went mainstream in 1996. So you can see what's going on now too, like that 20 years is coming up for um, a lot of those early drugs, they're, they're going to lose the patent. So uh, there are generic, medication, uh, generic production of some AIDS medications going on now and have been for a few years, um, but once those, uh, monopoly, those patents expire, um, of course the big fear, the real fear, is not within developing countries, but it's here in the United States. Currently, um, for someone on uh, AIDS medications in the US, for example, it costs um, $16,000 per year per person. With generic drugs, we've able, through um, policies, activism, what have you, it's dropped down to around $89. $89 a year, but in the US, where we, where the drugs are paid through Medicare, ADAP, what have you, but we're paying $16,000 per person. Mm. They talk about why Medicaid's bust. I mean, it's one simple way is to, uh, but we all know the government is in big farmer's pocket. So, um, <coughs> next slide, Amanda. We're, we actually are, okay, we're good. We're, what? Um, actually, okay. could you pass me my glasses? Yeah. Yeah, just the glasses. Yeah, yeah. I think now. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's better. No. Oh, good. Yeah. So, um,. Yeah, so generic competition, the first line AIDS medications reduce our prices in developing countries by more than 98%. What um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as we've heard, has been promoted as the high standard 21st century agreement. Once you're in, you're in. When you want to come in, you can't alter you know, any of the rules. Um, they're calling it the, the, for the golden rules of the future of IP, intellectual property. Um, and, um, and, and uh, folks, uh, are folks familiar with TRIPS um, when we're talking about trade? Okay, so um, uh, what couldn't be obtained through TRIPS is what is being sought after through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. TRIPS, um, five minutes, damn. Um, okay. Um, 
Um, okay, try to make it short that how the TPP affects this access to meds. Um, it will, uh, of course, we've got the mandatory patent terms, but what it also does is include data exclusivity, which means when, when patented drugs, um, before they come onto the market, obviously they have to go through a number of clinical trials. This takes a number of years and, it, and a whole lot of dollars. What the, the TPP will insist, will, will make mandatory, is that there's another 6 to 13 years of data exclusivity for that generic producer. So even if the licenses, the compulsory or parallel licenses, are granted for that particular drug, they're not allowed to use the evidence that this drug is good and would receive, for instance, FDA approval, um, they, have to, they have to do their own clinical trial, which would take millions of dollars and add on another how many years. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and it would also, this is the doozy, as you guys say on this side of the Atlantic, it provides the, um, the investor rights that if, if um, the, the, the pharmaceutical company should, should, the, should country A be able to um, produce the generic drugs, the pharmaceutical company um, in the US would be able to sue the country for, yeah, I'm, I apologize for not knowing the details about this one, but they are able to sue the country for, for making, making the drug, yeah. So like you said, I mean, it's just NAFTA on steroids. Um, where we have seen progress where, um, on this, though, was the South Africa case um, back in uh, 1997. I think it was when Al Gore was running for president. Was that 97? 98? 2000. Well, okay. So in 99, when he was on the campaign, when he was on the campaign trail, he was advocating, um, as uh, Big Pharma advised him, for the intellectual property rights of pharmaceutical companies, which in reality meant that um, in a trade deal that was happening um, with countries in Africa, namely the country of South Africa, which at that time and still today has the highest number of people living with HIV and AIDS, meant that they would not be able to produce generic medications. What, this was at the, actually the very beginning of HealthGap, when HealthGap first got started. A lot of us came from ACT UP, um, another similar uh, uh, grassroots groups. Um, what we did, it, it was a ge genius little campaign, if I do say so myself. Um, uh, he announced, uh, Al Gore announced his uh, run for presidency in his home base of Carthage, Tennessee. Um, Twelve people um, took a bus down to Carthage, managed to get in, you know they have folks on the stage sitting behind, managed to get seats behind Al Gore when he was going to announce uh, the pres uh, his run for presidency, and pulled out, which I have a beautiful photo here, but you can't see it, pulled out a banner which said, Gore kills Africans with AIDS. Horrendous, right? <laughs> like, his people, it was five, and it was live, live TV, there was nothing they could do. So then, he then goes, um, the next stop is New Hampshire. We have 12 more people who are still in New York, they're on their way to New Hampshire, do exactly the same thing, um, and have another banner exactly the same with Gore kills Africa, you know, Africans with AIDS. So anyway, of course, the people want to speak to us, what the hell's going on? And we managed, what, are they, what is it Margaret Mead says about, um, you know, a few people? I mean, just through that action, uh, granted it took a lot of gas, a few people, and, you know, some driving around the country, but managed to get him to retract that statement. Um, yeah, right? And so, um, yeah, went forward with uh, South Africa being able to import generic medications for folks living with AIDS. So, yeah, it can all sound really bad and overwhelming and huge and crazy, but we do have the friggin' power to, to change this shit up. We do. We really do. Um, okay, I'm running out of time, right? Three more minutes. Um, uh, okay, so, oh, with the TPP, right now India um, has uh, got the nickname kind of like the pharmacy of the poor. This is where the majority of...
generic medications, not just AIDS drugs, but other medications are made. Um, so the, the, there, is a, there is a danger there too now um, with the, the concentration of um, generic producers in that country um, where we see deals being made between generic producers to, to keep those prices up. And so, um, other, interestingly, um, the other countries that are burgeoning generic producers are those South Asian countries that are within the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. So again, it would be another way, that way, to, to stem the production of, of generic AIDS meds by, um, yeah, through, through, through uh, those countries. Um, so... Let me see. Um, so, okay, in one, one slide. Free trade agreements used as a barrier to HIV meds. Um, it's being negotiated right now, the 11 countries. It would deny people the right to oppose patents before they're granted, which we have now, but now the patents will be granted, and you know how much harder it is to, to, to get anything out before it's... You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, it would allow drug companies to make minor changes to old medicines to get the new 20-year patent. Uh, there's a thing called evergreening. Um, like you may see some of the drugs we know and love, uh, you know, say like Advil, where you, know, you, have, you have the drug and then they say it's like the new improved and apparently you've got maybe like an extra two hours of pain relief or something. So that they can get an extra an extra patent. I mean, Advil's a bad choice because there are many generic forms of ibuprofen now, but that's, that's the way where they could, they're not actually producing a new drug. They're slightly skewing, tweaking the current drug, but in, it enables them to get another 20 years of exclusivity on that drug. This is what um, the TPP would, would encase. And, uh, okay, so wrapping it up. Let me all wrap it up. Um, what you can do um, right now, unfortunately, just timing, um, we don't have anything on the table right now um, around the TPP that we're doing specifically. Um, but please, whenever you are um, doing any actions around the Trans-Pacific Partnership or speaking to any of your um, elected representatives, please do include this, this issue of access to medicines. Um, we'd be happy to speak with you or participate in any kind of workshop, training, whatever you may be thinking of. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you plan a demonstration, we'll be there with you. So, um, yeah, I think that's it right now. Cheers. Thanks. got a petition he'll be circulating. If you haven't signed our sign-in sheet yet today, um, there's also a sign-in sheet circulating. That's because today it is a teach-in, it is informative, we have amazing panelists in the room, but it's also about organizing. And there's an amazing crowd in here this evening, and I know you're all connected with communities um, throughout New York City and throughout the globe, so we don't want to miss the chance to follow up with you. Um, you know, as Amanda was speaking, I was recalling the movement in 2001 against the free trade area of the Americas. Was anybody um, paying attention back then? Raise your hand. Did you oppose the FTAA, otherwise known as ALCA, right? So at that point in time, there was um, an amazing thing happening, right? Um, well, actually, let's go back one more. Who, who was organizing already when NAFTA passed in 1994? All right, Joe Friendly. Anybody else? Got a hand in the back, hand in the front. Myself, I was graduating from high school. I went to Mexico. First time I got to see the border. But um, so it's been it's been happening. It's been rolling out, right? The first thing they did in '94, Mexico, Canada, the United States. The next big push was they were going to conglomerate all of South America into the FTAA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas, and it mobilized 
uh, farm workers and students and anti-mining activists and environmentalists and women and all of these different sections that we um, continue to, to build with today. Um, we're coming together for, for regional and hemispheric um, conferences, right, including the, the World Social Forum, which is uh, one of the things that, that our next speaker is connected with. And, um, and you saw this amazing grassroots movement and on one side, and then this, um, these secret government talks on the other. And at that point in time, in 2001, all of a sudden, we had, um, actually, before I go there, there was, there was one government um, that already was putting into action what the people were demanding. And that, at that point in time was Lula in Brazil, right? And it was exactly around access to AIDS medication and HIV medication and generic meds. And um, he's one of those reasons, you know, so many of us get disillusioned with uh, our elected officials and formal politics. Um, but Lula is one of those examples in this hemisphere of right-wing governments. All of a sudden, you elect a man who had come up in a poor family without running water, without electricity, right, without a formal education at that point in time, and um, elect him to power, right, when, uh, in Brazil, the largest country in, the, in South America. And he didn't forget his people. And he stood in the face of all of these other forces, these corporate and political and military forces, to say, my people need access to medication, and I really don't care what you say about it. It's going to happen. And um, it started to shift the tide. Uh, and now we see that we actually have a crew of left-leaning governments in Latin America who have actually built a trading block to counter um, this, this vision of, of free trade taking over our hemisphere, right? So we talked about the FTAA on the one hand, which never passed. Um, the, the emerging counter-hegemonic force, for those academics in the room, right? <laughs> was the ALBA, um, in Spanish, the dawning, right? Um, starting out between Cuba and Venezuela, trading doctors for oil, and growing to include Bolivia and Ecuador and Honduras before the coup, um, Nicaragua, a number of, and who am I forgetting? Anyone else? Part of ALBA? Ecuador, I said Ecuador. Argentina, that's right, I heard they were trading cows for doctors. Beef, sorry to the vegans in the room. Anyway, um, it is appropriate that we speak about vegans. That's a perfect segue. Our next speaker is um, Ana Maria Quispe. Actually, before I introduce her, if anyone is, didn't hear announcements at the beginning of the bathroom, in the, in the back on this floor to the right, right where you passed by the, uh, the two chairs. Also, there's translation here in the front. Hay traducción aquí adelante. Entonces, si no hablas inglés, por favor. Um, so those quick announcements. So Ana Maria Quispe is our next speaker. Um, she's actually uh, speaking to us right before she flies back to Peru, uh, which is her native country, though she's a proud and uh, New Jerseyan. <laughs> I was about to say you're a proud New Yorker, and I was like, nah, she's from the other side of the river. But um, uh, the other side of the river is definitely in, in recognition of this connectedness, right, between the water and the land. Anna is someone who identifies as an activist from, what, how do you say it, from fork to, to power? I read something like that in your bio. Um, she, she's talking about what we eat and how the decisions that we make around what we eat can change the world, right? Um, and, and if we don't have choices over what we're eating, then we're going to be a lot, um, it's going to be a lot harder. So um, Anna works with people directly and on a community level to connect us with some of our roots, ancestral diets, vegan diets, sustainable diets. And um, she's also an expert on the policies that, um, that are affecting our access to healthy food. So Anna Maria, please, I'm sorry for the long introduction. Come on up. Do you want to sit or stand? Sure, let's put our hands together for Anna Maria. Yay, we're really happy that you uh, crossed the river to speak with us today. It looks like they got the projection. I personally was kind of... Is anyone? I mean, do you want to sit or stand? You're going to walk around. Go through it, and then I go to enter, right? I mean, to go to the next slide or something? Somebody knows how Okay, can, can everybody see, uh, watch from in the back? Is, it, is this clear? I try to make the font big. 
or the arrow? Uh, this arrow. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, uh, my name is Ana Maria. I am a nutritionist. I graduated actually from Montclair State University and, um, and I quit my job because uh, I found it use, useless uh, when I saw that our food is in the hands of just a bunch of corporations. And this is what TPP is all about, is uh, all these corporations having the power of our food all over the world. And unfortunately, um, because it's the secrecy of the TPP uh, is not allowing us you know, to see what's behind the food, despite the fact that in the past, I believe maybe 10 years, we had uh, documentaries, investigations. I mean, there are plenty of books uh, to read about um, GMOs, uh, transgenics, and how bad it is uh, for you and for your health and things like that. So that's what I titled TPP and GMOs, Poisoning the Land, the People, uh, the Environment. Oh, I don't know what happened to it, but it, it seems like something happened. Okay. So uh, the Trans-Pacific, as you heard from Pete, is a, free, is a new model of a free, free trade agreement with 11 countries, but more countries might join, and, and that's one of the problems. Am I okay? Should I go this side? Oh, yeah, I think it's easier. Okay, and, and when it comes to, um, th that means that all commodities are for sale. And commodities means everything that we can trade, you know, interchangeable, you know, U.S. selling any of the countries or the countries selling um, to the U.S., um, which is, you know, the concern is in labeling, not just for, for the GMOs or, or where are they made of or coming from, but it has to do also with social justice it has to do with um, what is going behind every product made in the world, who benefits really uh, financially from it, and that's what the problem with GMOs are. Can we make a choice? How can we make a choice if we don't have a label? And so that's, that's mainly what we have. Most of us uh, and, uh, don't know what's in our food, and unfortunately, in the United States, most of our processed food has in one form or another GMOs, and that's what the problem is. So um, I don't want to go too, too much about uh, you know the, the new biotechnology about uh, GMOs, um, which is the transferring of the genes. By the way, there are other forms. There is also a transferring of tissues, but this is the, the main um, a problem with the GMOs is the transferring of the genes between cells, and sometimes it's between unrelated species. We all know about the tomato uh, having the fish gene or um, the Bt corn, and, and, and I can go on. Uh, but uh, despite the fact that they all advertise, the biotechnology corporations advertise these things are being very beneficial since they made them in the, in the 1980s. Um, we have really seen that none of the things they say, they promise uh, more food, they were going to the new green revolution, they promise a lot of things with these new GMOs, and, and none of that has happened. Uh, um, as, as a matter of fact, we have more hungry people in the world, and this is what is all uh, related. So the purpose is really, it has really increased the herbicide use, perhaps just one. Because one of the arguments they say, oh, we are not using, you know, other herbicides, but they use one, and, and, and that's the point, which is the Roundup. Uh, encourages weeds to develop genetic resistance, and especially the glyphosate, which is the, the chemical main ingredient of Roundup. Um, why uh, the TPP is obviously um, against GMO labeling. Oh, there's something wrong with... I'm, I'm just noticing, it's supposed to say, maybe because of the way it's, I don't know, but it's supposed to say TPP is against GMO labeling. Uh, first of all, we know that U.S. is the largest producer of GMO crops, and we uh, export it all over the world. Um, the leading uh, company, I'm sure everybody knows about, about Monsanto, uh, and no, no, it's not only Monsanto, it's Monsanto, Cargill, Syngenta, DuPont, and all these other companies that are, you know, that are producing either the seeds or they are owners of the land in some countries. And, uh, 
And the TPP obviously don't want everybody um, to know or, or, or to label, but unfortunately some of the countries in the TPP right now, you know, some of the living countries have some sort of uh, legislation against GMO. New Zealand, Austra Australia just uh, became, uh, I just got a document uh, recently that is, is kind of like stronger against uh, GMOs. Um, Chile has been always like in business with the with USA. Peru is because it's my country and it's because where I'm living right now. I, it is it's an special case that I've been following um, since the beginning uh, because we have a, an overwhelming bomb, ban on GMO crops. However, we don't have a ban on GMO ingredients. And as a matter of fact, there is an organization, it's kind of like a consumer, like a consumer reporting to you. And when they tested, uh, they send out 13 products that uh, that we use, you know, process uh, foods in Peru to Germany to be tested. Out of 13, 10 had GMOs already. That's uh, so. Peru is kind of like up in arms, and Peru is also a, a major, uh, um, it's a, a biodiverse country. It's the fifth in the world, by the way. And now with the, I don't know if you have heard about the International Year of Quinoa, which is going to be uh, proclamated next year, and, and, and some of us trying to recuperate our ancient food that we have it for like five to ten thousands of years. It's amazing that in Peru, foods that you can see sometimes if you go to any museum in Peru and you see the, uh, for example, the, the, the bio loche, which is like a pumpkin that is delicious. I mean, you see the pre-Inca uh, ceramic with all these pictures of all these foods, and it's amazing. So, um, and Japan is also entering, it's um, um, been interesting, like, you know, like did I believe, said, uh, the TPP uh, agreement, and also has some uh, legislation against GMO. Uh, there is a preoccupation because if it's pushing against the GMO labeling, Japan has already a labeling and uh, they imported, by the way, they import soybeans from the U.S., but they have to be non-GMO. And the alfalfa is the new problem that we do have. So um, uh, the GMO, uh, well, yeah, I don't know what happened with my slides or <laughs> all this stuff. Uh, well, like I said, uh, GMO is, the, the ra is it's about the Roundup herbicide. Monsanto uses, uh, some of the crops use this Roundup, is, uh, that's the commercial name that has glyphosate as the main ingredient. And we all know and it's an endocrine disruptor. Uh, it's been related to cancer of tumors, birth defects, uh, developing disorders, uh, learning disabilities, attention deficit disorder, and so on, malformation of the league, sexual development uh, problems, the feminization of, uh, um, of like some of the animals that, you know. And for example, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see well, uh, this uh, picture is part of an investigation that was uh, published at the NACLA magazine, which is a North American uh, Congress for Latin America. And, and they, she is, uh, is Miguel Angeles Bogado. She, she was born in Paraguay. Her father was, uh, the parents were working in the land for Cargill. The, the land, by the way, is owned by Cargill, but the soybeans are from Monsanto. And this is one of the rare cases of children surviving. Um, I believe this was taken a couple of years ago, and she was like 14 then. You know, so, so she kind of like became the foster child to prove, you know, the damages of GMO. Like we said uh, before, the TPP could force all the TPP member countries to remove the labeling. The labeling is all we have to protect our right to know or to ban GMOs in our countries, or in all, all different countries that might enter even in the future, uh, the, you know, the TPP agreement. And an, as an example, if you go to recently when we had the elections, we had, the, I don't know if you follow the, the, one of the issues in the ballot of the California was the um, Proposition 37. And you can see some of the actors there, I'm not so sure if it's clear, 
but uh, there is a list of heroes, means uh, people who really donated uh, people to raise money in order to uh, to pass this uh, ban. Unfortunately, unfortunately, was defeated. All these companies raised 47 million dollars, and you can see some of the actors there. And there was an advertisement trying to convince Californians not to pass the labeling on GMOs under the pretext that it was going to raise prices on the food. And we already know how food prices are. Uh, so obviously the, uh, the TPP requires the GMO access to markets. All they want is really to sell. Uh, Japan, like I said, uh, it had a, a ban on GMO, imports the majority of the U.S. alfalfa, and, and uh, well, the U.S. alfalfa, which is Monsanto, and it, they're all working together with some other company, which is Lanto Lakes. Um, if, if, the, if, TPP, if Japan enters TPP, it might be forced to ban this, and that's what the problem is going to be. Um, and, and also, Japan uh, banned um, GMOs because of because of the individual shows, because we, we have a right to choose, and also because of the effect on the, on the native uh, ecosystems. Other countries are Korea has also banned, but before Korea entered another course, which is a free trade agreement with Korea and the U.S., U.S. forced uh, Korea you know, to, to, to um, dismiss the ban on GMOs. Europe also has another, another ban. Um, Canada and Canada has an special uh, case with RBGH, which is the recombinant and bovin growth hormone that is uh, injected in the uh, in the ear of a cow to produce more milk, basically. And it's uh, it's not a crop, but it's still they use the same technology, the biotechnology uh, of OGM. Uh, Canada has also a, a, a kind of like the poster farmer. Uh, to, to, uh, for, for this fight against GMO. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Percy Meiser. There is a movie about Percy called David versus Monsanto. And, um, and they, he uh, stand, you know, it was, it was a threat um, that he has received uh, from uh, Monsanto, another corporation, because he stand up against the corporation, risking everything. You know, he was going to lose everything, and uh, unfortunately, he won. And because of that, he also won an award in Germany. I believe it's the Right, right Livelihood Award. Uh, so, you know, the, we have proof already, and there are many studies of cross-contamination of GMO, uh, the, the glufosinate or the glyphosate uh, resistant. Uh, for example, in the Brassica, and this is uh, the OLC rate uh, and, and analysis, for example, has been found in Japan already in the Kanto district to, that it was contaminated. The, it was the first case that that it happened in a place where GMO crops are not grown. So it seems like when they imported the seeds, you know, like when they imported the, the food, it seems like it, it, it flew away, and that's why they discovered this contamination. And that's very important. And, and Japan is not the only one. There was Switzerland also recently had a similar case of cross-contamination. And also there have been some studies uh, here in the U.S. Uh, in the case of uh, Roundup alfalfa, in June of 2005, uh, the USDA approved the round red, Roundup Ready alfalfa, and, uh, and obviously we know that increases the herbicide use, and, uh, and you can see that they say that we are not going to use uh, pesticides or herbicides, and that's false because it has risen in the, in the past uh, decade. Uh, then we have, you know, problems with the the alfalfa is an open uh, pollinated crop and the, it is more dangerous uh, of cross contamination and uh, and then we we continue uh, it, that really is a crop that is is it could endanger our dairy uh, products for example and uh, so it's a threat to all foods uh, the health cost, uh, there has not been an analysis of workers and people near the GM crops. We don't, we don't know how much it costs. Yet, however, we, ha uh, we know it's related to the obesity epidemic uh, because of NAFTA, because the farmers in Mexico um, were forced 
uh, to buy the GMO corn from the U.S. And actually, all the tortillas in Mexico, I believe, is like over 70 percent, uh, you know, are from are from GMO corn, U.S. Uh, GMO corn. And so that's one of the examples. Of, uh, France has also, and France has a nice uh, movie about also the damages that is happening to children. Argentina has another. Uh, famous uh, study that was made by Dr. Andres Carrasco, uh, they work on GMOs and, and chicken embryos, and the damages are similar in, uh, in the embryos as, they, as we see in Paraguay, for example, as Miguel Ángel Esbogado. Uh, you know, it, I mean, the damages, you, we can go on, you know, uh, so I, I really want to go to uh, it's, it's a cancer, obviously, Monsanto, and, and like I said before, it's not only Monsanto, there are a lot of companies. So GMOs is really an, against expansion, and I just want to go into what we must do as an activist. Because I am sure we must be an activist, because if you are not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. That's as simple as that. So it local sustainable. I know a lot of people say, well, it's more expensive, and yet I teach people how to eat organic on the budget, on the on food stamp budget, and, and believe me, it's, it's not that bad, and it's great, and, and I have tested many times. We can grow our own food. My father is 87. We have our garden. If anybody uh, wants to go into my, um, on, into my blog, and, um, and, and if you pass by in the summertime, you can always get out of my house, which is a tiny little garden uh, with figs, and we grow, you know, some, some things. Uh, join a CSA community. New York is a good example of this. Uh, prefers the farmer's market. Ask your vendor for organic, local, sustainable. Uh, and reject food from big food, you know? Um, I'm not so sure if, if you can see this. This was done by a uh, French um, a study and a lot of people we see a lot of brands in the market and we don't know how they are all related so there is a picture of how they're all related and obviously also some of them might not be food uh, so the owners are always like a bunch of corporations and that's what's going on uh, educate our, you know yourself lobby your legislation uh, uh, demand the GMO research Remember, the research that has been done is not independent and hasn't been published. And some people who have found uh, the problems with the GMO, uh, Dr. Putsai, for example, was fired. And so that, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, demand fair wages. And even in organic food, uh, recently there was an NPR uh, program that is still there are illegal aliens working, you know, in the farmers' markets, and and unfortunately people keep saying, well, we really would like to pay more, but are we willing to pay more? And I think that it helps the market. We can stop maybe all these things that we don't need, and and just uh, you know buy from uh, these people. This I got from uh, Cuba. It says transgenic is a danger. The plaguicide or pesticide are poison. Organic is life you decide. So again, we, got, we must oppose these free uh, trade agreements, the liberalization and the globalization of, of these foods. Uh, uh, there are many things that you can do, you know, be against the big, we call it big food, you know, and, and last year I did a, a speech uh, for the farmers, for the Occupy movement, uh, and it, it's a big uh, agro-business. Um, also, um, Fight for the for food security. Remember, is also our security at stake. The control or the news that you hear that the foods are, you know, that are raising in price are these crops, and these crops drive the prices of other crops, and that's what the relationship is. Um, you know, go against, uh, you know, crop life. By the way, if we, if you don't know, is an NGO that operates all over the world except Cuba, at very few places, and they are NGOs that uh, have as members Monsanto, DuPont, Cargill, and all of them. So we, in each of these countries, we, they had insiders already, and that's what the problem is. Know who the players are, you know, Siddiqui is one of them, and if anybody has watched the movie uh, Food Inc., anybody has watched the movie Food Inc., you can see like more players and there's a revolving door of people in our um, administration and also working for Monsanto, kind of like, you know, 
So that's happened. So the TPP is really against GMO bans. It's about expansion of GMOs, the world food uh, monopoly. Uh, so we have many uh, risks of health in, uh, in the U.S. and abroad, and so we must fight the TPP. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ana Maria. And I know, I hate to, uh, to put up a sign and say time, um, because there is such a wealth of information in our fabulous panelists today. So I just want to say thank you again for being here, and don't despair. Um, we're going to have time in small groups, um, as well as a question and answer, as soon as we um, have our last speaker, who's about to come up. So um, just so you know, at that point in time, we're going to have this mic for people with questions, and so we're going to ask that you line up to ask those questions in a way that everyone can hear, and that um, be prepared to be, you know, succinct with a question, not with a uh, fifth panelist intervention. Um, so I, I just want to, to share, right, it can get, uh, there's all this fabulous information, right, and, it, and it's all over the place. Um, when I first started working um, in, in New York to try to connect the dots between what's true in New York and what's happening internationally. I worked for an organization called Pastors for Peace. Um, anyone heard of Pastors for Peace? All right. Um, in fact, our translator here is, is, is from that network. Laura, thank you. Um, so Pastors for Peace is doing people-to-people uh, -people foreign policy, right? Challenging human rights violations. Um, in the U.S. foreign policy toward Cuba and toward Central America. So having come fresh off the boat from Nicaragua to New York, I was super excited to, um, to start working for them and to connect the dots between the free trade zones that in Nicaragua had started out. Um, and so there was all this movement against free trade in Nicaragua, and I wanted to put it front and center on the agenda for Passes for Peace. So when I got the Reverend Lucius Walker Jr. in the room, and I'm like, here's what it's about, you know, and I broke it down, free trade, da 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 da, -da. And he listened very patiently, and then he looked at me and he said, so let's just let me get this straight. It's about land, and water, and food, and education, and workers' rights. And I was like, yes, like, yes, he gets it. And he's like, so it's always been about you know? <laughs> um, so he was coming from the, the 60s and civil rights and the African diaspora and the, um, the, the movement against colonization in Africa. And, um, you know, these, these fights have been in action for a long time and um, they're taking different forms, right? We shut down the FTAA in Latin America and so now they're trying to uh, crisscross the Pacific and, um, and draw a different kind of net. But we're smarter, we're faster, we're broader, we're more creative than all of their short-sighted, fear-based violence. Um, so, are you ready, Adam? Our last speaker today is Adam Weissman. I'd be shocked if anyone in this room doesn't already know Adam. Um, if you didn't know him before, you'll certainly hear from him after. Um, Adam is, is a tireless organizer for global justice and for animal rights and, um, for, and for building awareness. Um, as a committed act, uh, anarchist, you might be surprised how much knowledge he held about how our uh, supposed democratic, or maybe I should just say legislative system works, um, and what's exactly um, dysfunctional and disconnected in terms of our current Congress and lawmaking and all the institutions that um, are being hijacked to implement this global agenda. So Adam has prepared a slide to kind of go over some of the key environmental issues at stake, um, and as well as the investor clauses in the free trade agreement. I'm sure you guys have been around since 94 with NAFTA, know about Chapter 11. You know, in CAPTA it was Chapter 10. They change up the numbers, they change up the language, but it's the same. It's about hijacking the institutions that we use to protect ourselves. Um, and so, as long as we're informed, we can stay a step ahead of them. So I want to thank Adam for, for all the work that he did to put this event together this evening. How are we doing? Are we ready? In the meantime, where's my sign-in sheet? Did it get around? Anybody in the back hasn't signed it, make sure you find it. Raise your hand if, you're a, if you tweet. Do we have any clever hashtags that are circulating out there in cyberspace already? Any, any messages to our 
to our virtual audience. Where's the camera at? Hi, virtual audience. What's going on? What? I thought I heard a hashtag, a clever one. I just put N-O-T-P-P, because -P, I'm sure there's a movement out there already. Adam's official bio? We know about enough about Adam right now. Now you're going to hear how his inside of his mind works. Let's do this. Thanks for your patience. Um, my name is Adam Weissman. I work with an organization called Global Justice for Animals and the Environment. Global Justice for Animals and the Environment is an organization that works to oppose free trade agreements uh, with a primary focus on their impacts on the environment, food safety, the human rights of communities on the front lines of environmental struggles, and animal rights. And I'm going to be talking to you a bit today about uh, NAFTA Chapter 11, the Investor State Dispute Resolution Clause, and how that NAFTA investor state model has been replicated in other free trade agreements, um, and has, have had, which have had disastrous implications for the environment. You may have heard, so how many of you, at a, by a show of hands, were at our event on October 26th? Okay, so a bunch of you. Um, you might have also seen our email saying that at that event where we were warning specifically about how free trade agreements were going to be used to attack fracking bans, just about a little over a week, and a week and a half later, exactly that happened. And we're going to be looking at exactly what that means um, and what we can do to fight that, both in terms of NAFTA, the free trade agreement we already have, and TPP, the free trade agreement that President Obama is trying to give us. So, uh, NAFTA was passed in 1994. Um, it was, in contrast to previous free trade agreements, it included investor state rules that give corporations the right to sue governments for enforcing their laws. Um, that, as I said, that model was replicated. Oh, okay. <laughs> was replicated through later trade agreements. So NAFTA was essentially the template that's been rubber stamped onto all the trade agreements that. Uh, uh, really, most of the trade agreements that the U.S. has negotiated since. There are exceptions. For example, the U.S.-Australia Free Trade Agreement does not have these odious investor rules. Um, but in terms of the ones we've seen in this decade, uh, CAFTA, the Central America Free Trade Agreement, the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement, the Free Trade Agreements of uh, South Korea and Panama, all of them have these kinds of investor state rules that in a moment we're going to find out why we should be so concerned about. Um, so how do these cases work? Um, a corporation brings a challenge, for reasons that we'll see momentarily, uh, saying that a law, an environmental law, a consumer protection law, a uh, public health or safety law, um, is a violation of their investor rights, their right to profit, their right to future profits, their right to profits they haven't made yet on their investments. Um, they bring these cases to international tribunals, which are provided, uh, presided over by three judges who are basically international trade lawyers who another week might be working as corporate lawyers for some of the same kinds of corporations that bring these cases. Um, they supersede the national court systems of the individual countries, so it's not that they go to the court systems of countries, these are extra-national tribunals that have the weight of law over, over what, beyond uh, the individual court systems of these countries. Uh, the in international agreements that, these, that countries sign that make these rules possible have, have the weight of law, so these trade agreements um, can be used to knock down the laws that we have domestically. The, as you can see, the U.S. has lost most of the cases, the vast majority of the cases lost against it, including some of the most important ones. Uh, foreign investors under free trade agreements are actually given greater rights than, than domestic investors, meaning if you are a company based in the U.S. and the U.S 
has, uh, says that you have to clean up a mine and that's going to cost you money and you don't want to do that, you don't have the recourse of going to these international tribunals. On the other hand, if you're a Canadian company and you're invested in the U.S., you can do that under NAFTA. So greater rights are actually given to international corporations than to domestic corporations. So the cost to taxpayers of these free trade agreements has already been massive. Um, in the U.S., we haven't seen under NAFTA um, we haven't seen 100% of the rulings go against uh, the U.S. public interest, but every one of these cases is costly, both in terms of the rulings that can potentially come out of them, but also just the cost of fighting these arbitrations. So just a couple examples of some of the cases. Um, one of the earliest and most odious in the mid-90s, Metal Clad uh, was, suing, was uh, attempted to build an incredibly uh, toxic landfill in Mexico. Um, there was opposition in Mexico and so they were stopped from doing that. Uh, they sued under NAFTA uh, saying that preventing them from creating this toxic landfill was a violation of their investor rights. And an international tribunal ruled that in fact Mexico was violating their right to demand the right to pollute Mexico. Um, another corporation, the Ethel Corporation, um, sued Canada for over 200 million when Canada banned a fuel additive uh, that contained a known neurotoxin. Um, Canada then dropped the law and paid a, a settlement. And that's what we see happen time and again. For countries that lose these cases, not only, are they, not only do they lose their laws, but they're required to pay enormous sums of money. Um, so for many of these cases, they never even make it as far as the end of, a of an arbitration process because for smaller countries, poorer countries, they can't afford to even, they can't afford the risk of losing some of these cases. So one of the things that these, uh, th these rules have is a chilling effect on environmental laws being passed in the first place because countries realize that if they have these laws on the books and then enforce them, they could potentially be liable for millions uh, in demanded compensation. Uh, sort of the flip-flop of the ethyl case we just heard about, um, in uh, California phased out the use of, MB of a fuel additive, MBTE, that it found was contaminating water. So Methanex, in this case a Canadian corporation, uh, sued, Cal sued NAFTA to try to get the California case, the uh, California rule overturned. Um, finally, uh, and this is a, something that happens with the U.S., not as much as other countries. The U.S. sometimes wins these cases. They're still very costly to get to that point. The U.S. has the resources to fight these cases. So it's a good thing that occasionally environmental laws stand, but the problem is when only the richest, you know, most powerful country in the world has the power to do that, that's not such a good thing. Um, another case here in the U.S., Glamis, a notorious gold mining company known worldwide for pollution and human rights abuses. Um, decided that they didn't really want to backfill a mine uh, that was on sacred land of, Indi of uh, Native American peoples in California, in the Imperial Valley of California. So they brought a suit that went on for years and years saying that being required to backfill this mine and not leave a basic giant pit um, after they mined uh, was a violation of their investor rights. And uh, again, the U.S. won this case, but it, was, it cost an awful lot of money to get there. Another case, um, a, tobacco com a Canadian tobacco company is, is seeking damages over the U.S. tobacco settlement, saying that uh, requiring tobacco companies to compensate people for the massive health damages and deaths that they've caused is a violation of the rights of tobacco companies to profit. So, um, sorry, bad pun. But, um, so a transformer company, not the robot kind, the kind that contain PCBs, um, brought a suit uh, challenging a Canadian PCB ban and successfully uh, won five million in the process. But uh, we should be reassured to know, um, oh, before I get to that, sorry. Um, for any of you who are not familiar with PCBs, they're carcinogens linked to a whole wide range of really bad health conditions. Uh, really nasty stuff, uh, developmental, uh, related to developmental delays, uh, irritation, carcin it, they're, they're carcinogenic, um, they disrupt hormone function, um, they have negative immune system and thyroid effects, 
Um, we should be reassured, though, to know that the company who brought this case um, it, it says on their website that their common, our common philosophy is governed by biblical principles and values. Uh, I'm not sure which book of the Bible they're talking about, but uh, maybe they're thinking, yeah, maybe they're thinking about Revelations. But um, <laughs> but uh, which which they're all four horsemen wrapped into one. Um, so a pesticide manufacturer uh, sued Canada. Uh, claiming that a Canadian ban on a toxic pesticide, Lindane, uh, which is a hazardous persistent organic pollutant, um, was a violation of their right to profit through their export. Uh, Lindane is very nasty stuff. Um, you can read out some of the different health effects on this slide. Um, it's linked to headaches, nervous system damage, it's particularly hazardous to children. Um, it, it's, a persistent, it's a persistent organic pollutant, it bioaccumulates cycles through the ecosystem. Okay, we're running out of time, so let's rush ahead. Um, so, okay, well, I'll just explain that now. Um, so, there's an in between when they brought this case and when, uh, in between they brought this case and the end of the case, um, there was an international ban passed on the substance. No one's supposed to use this stuff anymore, international agreement. Um, so you'd think, you know, the company, if the stuff is banned globally, they would drop the suit, right? I mean, how can you sue a country for abiding by an international ban? That would make sense, but that's not the way investor state works. Um, at the end of the day, Kemchura seeks to hold the Canadian Pest Management Regulatory Agency responsible for the fact that it can no longer profit from the sale of a toxic chemical that has been internationally banned based on a demonstrated health and environmental concern. That's uh, Canada's comment. So uh, our friend Jim Mays from the Sierra Club says, when you read through a lot of these cases, you find something missing, namely common sense. Um, so it's skipping ahead, more cases where corporations uh, attack pesticide bans. Here we have Dow attacking a Canadian ban on 2,4-D. Really nasty stuff. And you can read some of the effects of 2,4-D. Uh, this, uh, this is a demonstration we held when Dow held their uh, Dow Live Earth Run for Water to uh, protect water around the world from themselves, I guess. But um, there are the yes men impersonating Dow people. We have uh, Grim Reapers chasing people in the run, et cetera. Anyway. Um, in 2005, we have CAFTA passing with the same investment rules. Um, one of the cases under CAFTA that is, or the first case brought under CAFTA um, is particularly egregious and very appropriate that Phil Jocelyn rocks in the room at this moment. Hey, Phil. Uh, uh, you know, Captain. But uh, El Salvador. Anyway, so uh, Phil is with CISPIS, which is a group that's worked very hard on this issue. Um, El Salvador banned, uh, stopped a mining, uh, a, a corporation from mining uh, that was going to be dumping, uh, potentially dumping arsenic in the country's largest source of drinking water, the Rio Lempa. Um, the, they just, the corporation, two corporations that were invested, responded by suing. Uh, one of them for over $70 million, saying that this is a violation of their investor rights, their right to apparently make El Salvador have no drinking water. Uh, this case is closely tied also to a range of human rights atrocities, something we see often in these mining cases. Um, this case was brought to the International Center for the Settlement and Inve Investment Disputes, which is the World Bank Arbitration Court, where many of these cases go. Uh, here we are selling uh, Pacific Rim, that's the corporation, uh, bottled mineral water, tainted with cyanide. Um, one of the other uh, cases going on right now, there is a, a, Mexican, a U.S. investor in a Mexican smelting co uh, company that's, one of the most, that's created one of the most ha 10 most hazardous sites in the world. Uh, they two minutes, okay. They uh, have decided that being dema the demand for them to remediate is a violation of their investor right. So they're now suing, saying that they don't want to remediate. Uh, or they want to have their remediation delayed. So, uh, on to fracking and then wrapping up. Um, right, as I mentioned earlier, there's a case that's just been brought uh, because uh, against Quebec's back fracking ban by a company called Lone Pine. Um, and uh, Lone, uh, the company is saying they, they might be open to settling, in other words, getting paid a whole lot of money. Um, the Sierra Club has launched a petition to try to, to stop the TPP uh, from containing language that will, and investor rights that will uh, expand fracking. Um, 
Let's see. TPP should concern us even more than the trade agreements we've had before because it brings in even more co more countries, meaning more corporations, that have a right to attack things like fracking bans. So if we ban fracking in New York State, corporations in any of these countries that are invested in New York State will have the right to, under, through an international tribunal, attack our fracking ban as a violation of their right to profit off polluting our environment. So TPP is basically NAFTA on steroids. Um, it's secret, the, te so the texts are secret, but we know through leaks that it contains the same kind of NAFTA investor rules. Um, so what can we do? Um, we are missing a slide. Okay. Um, should I transition to the, what we can do then? Okay, I'll, I'll explain the, what that slide was, it's okay. Um, so, what can we do about all this, now that we've heard about all these disturbing problems. Uh, there's, there are a bunch of things, both short-term and long-term. Um, in the next month or so, there are two things that we can work on, um, which we have printouts on, which I'll find at some point. I brought them forward and don't know where I put them. Um, one is the Brown Bill, the uh, bill brought by Senator uh, Sherrod Brown, the uh, 21st Century Trade and Market Access Act, a bill. Uh, this is a bill that is designed to lay out a model of what trade agreements could look like. Trade agreements that have labor and environmental, strong environmental and labor laws built into them. Trade agreements that are designed to protect the public interest, not just expand corporate profits. So one of the things that activists around the country are trying to do right now is get senators to co-sponsor this bill. Um, so certainly our two New York senators need to hear from us on this, that we need this bill as a model of what, shouldn't, what TPP and these other trade agreements shouldn't look like, that we shouldn't have trade agreements that put the rights of pesticide producers and toxic frackers over the rights of our health. Um, another thing that we can do, there is a letter that's about to be launched an internet, it's a, a tri-country unity statement now that uh, Canada and Mexico have just been brought into TPP. We're trying to get together uh, organizations from these three countries to reject this model of free trade agreements for corporate benefit at the expense of the public interest. So in the next, that letter is going to be circulating until about mid-January. So we as New Yorkers can do everything we can to get lots of New York organizations to sign onto, these letter, in, onto this letter. Um, so those are two things that we can, we can start doing right now. Looking towards the future, um, going into next year, there are two battles, two additional battles that we need to start looking at. The, um, the Brown Bill is, uh, will be reintroduced, so that's something we can continue working on if we don't get commitments out of our senators before the end of this year. Uh, but there are two other things, two other bills being introduced next year that we need to think about. Um, one of them is Fast Track. Fast Track is the, the colloquial name for Trade Promotion Authority. And what that is, is legislation that is passed by Congress that limits Congress's right to have an impact on trade agreements. The, way, the, administration, the administration negotiates these agreements, and in theory, Congress is supposed to actually have a say over the things that they vote, about, vote on. So that makes things a little complicated, because you know, that might mean that there might be democracy or something. So they, tr they, don't, they obviously don't want that. So the way that they like doing it is having the president go and negotiate the trade agreements or the uh, U.S. trade representative on the, uh, of the just part of the administration negotiate these trade agreements on behalf of uh, and, and then uh, bring them to Congress uh, under fast track, which means that Congress can do one of two things. They can vote for them and they can vote against them. They can't change a word. Also, when they're sent to Congress, they're usually sent to Congress uh, with a 90-day mandatory vote. So Congress can't stall on them, they can't change them, all they can do is vote up or down. And what we've seen time and again is every time these trade agreements come to Congress, that way eventually they're voted on. Uh, Nancy, with the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, Nancy Pelosi, when she was, uh, when, when, uh, she was a speaker, uh, stalled one time, or one time broke the fast track rules because it was an election year and she knew that it was a ploy by Bush to uh, make the Democrats look bad to the unions. But um, they eventually went and voted for it anyway. So, um, so stopping fast track is going to be absolutely essential and letting our Congress members know that we don't want them to cede, our Democrat, to cede the democratic rights that they have on our behalf um, is really key. Another bill that we need to look at is the New York Jobs and Trade Act. 
And this is a bill that was uh, at the, in the New York State Legislature that says to Congress, hey Congress, if you're going to pass these rules that have profound implications for our state, that uh, will it can attack our state level laws, our state level environmental rulings, our state level uh, rules about government procurement, are, for example, these trade agreements can attack things like if we decide to pass a buy local, uh, buy green ordinance or a buy, buy American ordinance, that can be attacked under these trade agreements. Uh, if, if these laws are going to affect, if these trade agreements are going to affect us at the state level, we want to be able to have a say on them and we want to sign off on them. So, you know, Congress can potentially ignore them. But it's, it's, a, it's a powerful statement and it's, so it's a bill worth supporting. Um, so those are four things that we need to, to think about going ahead. and. As we go into the organizing portion of the evening, those are the four things we'll be four of the things we'll be discussing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. So um, now is the time when you guys get to ask some questions. I know that there's some questions in the room. There was a lot of information presented. Um, so I'm going to ask that um, two or three people come up at a time. So if you already see three people waiting here, that means you got to stay until there's only two, and then you can come up and get in line. That way we won't overcrowd. We're going to take about 20 minutes for this section, and um, my uh, experts stay in the front row, and we'll hand the mic to you as appropriate. You can stand up when there's a question directed towards you. So, any questions? If there's no immediate question, come on. I know Amanda had a question for Anna Maria. All right. I'll bring you the mic because you're a special guest. Thank you. What I don't understand um, is that, I mean, what I don't understand about Europe, it, well, there's a lot I don't understand about Europe, but <laughs> the fact that they have banned um, GM imports, right, apart from in animal feed, Except for animal feed, well if the animals are going to eat the GM products and then they're going to eat the animals, I mean it just doesn't make sense. Well, the, uh, yeah, that's why some of us are behind, uh, I mean that's the reason why we are vegans. Um, <laughs> and actually, uh, believe it or not, I was a vegetarian until uh, last year. Uh, I was still eating dairy and eggs and I had a salmonellosis that almost sent me to the other world. <laughs> And, um, and I decided uh, not to. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it, it ha and curiously, uh, Europe has an special case. It has been pushed by Germany. There is there's another document somewhere where uh, Germany approved because sort of like they need cheaper meats if we want meat to, to keep, continue to eat meats or, or dairy or eggs. So if we want cheaper meats or dairy or eggs, they're going to have to find a way to feed these animals cheaper. And the only way is through GMOs. And actually, either Carlos Bustamante, the one in, uh, there is a video, unfortunately, it's in Spanish, in Peru, he just said, he said the same thing. One of the reasons why he wants to ban our ban on GMO crops, he says because all the animals in Peru are already eating GMOs from Argentina, Paraguay, and uh, Brazil. So. They are all related. I mean, animal consumption, unfortunately, unless you buy from Joe Salatin, that is in a, the, the video, for example, of uh, Food Inc., you know, and, and, and obviously very expensive. And he doesn't sell, I believe Joe Salatin says, I don't sell it. Like, you have to go to his farm to sell it. I mean, how many of us can go, you know, miles and miles away to really buy these animals that are uh, non feed with genetic uh, modified feed? So that's a. Uh, that's a, a general uh, a problem. As more and more uh, people around the world want to eat meats, the industry has to find a way to, to feed. That's, that's what we say, and there are many books, and there is one, uh, it's called the Food, food Meats, I believe, is by one of the La Pez, uh, um, women, and, and it says, uh, eating meat causes global hunger because the, the, uh, the agricultural crops are not for people, are for the animals that we do eat. And if, if we continue asking for more animals or animal food, that's what's going to happen and that's why it's a risk. And that's why we, 
uh, it is a touchy subject sometimes when we say, you know, I'm a vegan and things like that. However, uh, that's what the indirect uh, action, you know, it should be. Thank you, Anna Maria. If you have a question, please come up. Um, we've got a mic here for you. Um, so, thank you. Hi, thank you everybody, it was wonderful. Um, actually, I have two brief questions. One is, if all these horrible things can happen with investor state tribunals and so forth, why do countries want to sign on to this? That's one question. There, there are goodies for them for doing this, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. I want to hear a little more about that so we know how to counteract it. Second question, long term, is there a way that we can fix the corporate structure to prevent this kind of atrocity. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for setting an example for sure and direct questions. I'm actually going to ask the speakers to actually come up and stand here because I think it's a little bit focused in the corner. So it'll only be a few minutes you have to stand, but if you come up that way, um, we'll be able to better address the, the questions. So the first one, well, you guys heard the questions. Do you want to take a stab? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to take a stab at that. I think what's in it for the countries isn't necessarily what's in it for the countries. What is in it is for who controls the countries. And I think that's maybe the perspective we should look at this. You know, the ideology of the whole global economic system is market forces, that there's these impartial blind forces. You know, it's like Lady Liberty with her blindfold over her and blind and just as, and, the, and the economy is supposed to be blind too but that isn't it what what are market forces market forces are simply the aggregate interests of the most powerful industrialists and financiers yeah, and they don't all have completely identical interests but they have enough commonality and of course all their interests for whatever this or that disagreement on this or that specific issue, maintaining this system as a totality, that's when their interest. Now, if enough organizations gain, get so much uh, money and can convert that into so much power, they're going to have the decisive influence over their government. So it's, not, it's, it's a matter of, you know, do you have democracy or don't you have democracy? We really don't. We have, we have plutocracy. So the governments are just simply expressing the interests of their most powerful en entities, which are their biggest corporations who operate transnationally. So that's why, that's why, the, governments, uh, uh, that's why the governments will be acting in that way. So to answer really briefly, I guess we'll break down and think about that second question because that's, that's really what it all comes down to. It's, uh, you know, concerted action of all of us. You know, we're the 1%. And we're the 99%. If the 99% acted in concert, 1% can't do anything more. As long as they keep us divided, then the 1% can, can, can run amok. That's the very, very short answer to that. Well, I keep repeating this, but it's consumption. And, and I'll never forget uh, a class, and I had said this before in another speech. Um, my, my economic professor one day said, who gives the power, who gave the power to corporations? Us. We are consumers after all. And that's why we keep, uh, keep saying, you know, we also have the power. If we are the 99%, imagine how would be the 99% don't buy for none of these corporations? It would be great, right? Maybe we wouldn't have to be worried about it. Unfortunately, you see, we don't know what's behind. We don't know the big pictures. And long term, that's the reason what I say we we got to uh, go to a uh, small farmer, not necessarily organic. I know where Stony Field has been bought. I mean, some of the organic food has been bought by big corporations. Coca-Cola is planning to make organic Coca-Cola. Uh, so, unfortunately, this is what's happening. Uh, but we have to go to our farmer. My farmer, I, I, I live in a tiny little town called Kearney, New Jersey, and I have only two farmers that come in the summertime. I visit both of them. I feel, you know, I, I, I go and I see, and they have like nice uh, uh, games for kids during the summertime. You can go and visit your family. They might not be labeled organic because it has to do with something with the law. Uh, some people cannot afford to label organic. It's mostly organic is for, for exportation. And there are better people that are growing organically without labeling organically because that's all they have been doing and also support the small farm because I have seen these things in Mexico and all the different countries. There are big 
people, big farmers in Mexico who work for the agribusiness and then we are eating like the broccoli from Mexico that has all these herbicides and pesticides and so on. So it's really scary and, and we are paying with our health. And that's billions and billions of dollars. Just obesity, I believe, costs 21 billion dollars a year to the United States. So imagine that. Do you have other questions? In the audience, you want to come forward? Don't be shy. If there's anyone else, you can follow her up so we can keep the pace going. Welcome. Hi, my name is Kenny. I'm brand new. This is the first time I'm here. Um, I'm here as a student, and I just have a quick question. As a student, I don't know how to afford organic food. You know, this all this information, I'm just starting to learn it. I'm starting to research on it. I'm starting to really, like, be unblindfolded by it. You know, this is all new information for me. So for someone who, you know, works and goes to school and just affords it to take care of herself, basically, how do you how do you budget organic food? Like you know, I try to stay away from McDonald's. I try to stay away from like the big obvious no's. Mm -hmm. But how do I just go into deeper? Because for example, I've eaten meat all my life. <laughs> I've and you know, and then when you watch something like Food Inc. and you see the hole in the cow and what you really go on, you're like, wait, hold up, like is this what I'm putting in my body? But it's it's such a dramatic change and. Great question. Great question. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess it's kind of obvious back to Anna. And if maybe if you can give three real specific um, starting places as well as maybe a web page where more information can be gotten. Uh, yeah, you, I, I give courses. Unfortunately, I won't be here, but I, I will be back in October, so maybe I can teach you some of you. You can, you can go into my courses. Um, it's www.annamariaquispe.com, uh, Anna with just one N, and, um, and, and you can find more information in my blog because I'm always like... We'll link it online to the Facebook page. Uh, yeah, you can go. That's my, my blog, but basically I translate or I make... Uh, I edit some of the articles related to GMOs or anything that is related to food, uh, food justice and things like that. You know, and, and there are little details. Maybe I'll just give you one example. Most, when you buy beets, a lot of people throw the leaves. We can make them. So there is a way, for example, to afford you know, uh, some other things. And when you buy the broccoli, some people, buy, you know, throw the stems, you know, because and you can make a cream out of it and just strain, you know, some of the extra fiber. Uh, there are things that we can do. And, and for example, uh, when the, the hurricane um, came and I was prepared, while everybody went, you know, ballistic to all these supermarkets, we just went to our farmer market and with the little two or three crops that we have in a tiny little garden, we only, we only uh, spent $20. And with those $20, we had leave four of us without electricity for four days. So there it goes. Thank you, Anna. Adam, you want to add a point to that? Yeah, um, fundamentally the problem of our food system, I mean, and, and what, we, you know, our, what, we're, what we're able to afford or address as consumers um, it is a political problem, and that's something that I, I think we, we need to understand. The fact that uh, unhealthy food is what people can afford, and that healthy food isn't, is not, it, it is not, a, is not an accident. It's something. It's, it, it's that's by design. Um, the corporation, some of the corporations who are most enthusiastic about these free trade agreements are the major agribusiness corporations, the, the major, the, the major meat producers, the uh, major feed grain producers. And the reason for that is one of the things these trade agreements do is eliminate the imp country's import tariffs on, um, on, on, ex on industrial farm exports. So for example, if you have a, 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 a country in the developing world which has a, tra a sustainable and more sustainable traditional model of agriculture, um, when we eliminate import tariffs on our genetically modified industrially produced uh, cheap petroleum uh, factory farmed um, corporate food, um, there's no way that um, th that the domestically produced products can compete in the marketplace against those, in against, against those industrial food exports. So what happens is two things. One is that the domestic producers are, are wiped out. That's why after NAFTA we saw a massive wave of immigration um, from Mexico into the United States because we destroyed the peasant agricultural base of Mexico with our, with our genetically modified corn exports, with our poultry exports, etc. Um, and the other thing that we see happening is that the industrial producers um, or offshore production to 
to developing countries. Um, so, for example, in Mexico, we saw uh, Smithfield, uh, uh, Smithfield Foods, the uh, ma massive, huge, dirty hog producer, industrial factory farm hog producer, after the passage of NAFTA, outsourcing a hog farm to Mexico because in Mexico they could escape U.S. regulations, produce under the filthiest of conditions, and then export back into the U.S. tariff-free. Um, well, what did that give us? That gave us swine flu. That, that happened in Veracruz, Mexico. It's where we incubated swine flu, killed 18,000 people. And um, we see that again and again, where, where farming is industrialized. Um, we, see that in, we see that in Southeast Asia with, uh, with, the, with, the, with epi epidemic bird flu being linked to an increasing international trade in livestock products and in livestock and increasing industrialization of agriculture. Um, so, you know, these... Bad cow. I mean, yeah, it, we've, uh, we've, we've seen... T with, uh, with mad cow, we see um, countries like Korea and Japan um, changing their import laws on beef products that were designed to prevent, uh, for example, Korea had a, a 30 month or had a 30 month rule that uh, they wouldn't import uh, beef from cattle that was over 30 months of age, and they dropped that in anticipation of the U.S. South Korea Free Trade Agreement because that was essentially set up as a precondition that they mm -hmm. that trying to protect their consumers against our beef. Uh, because their consumers were legitimately concerned about mad cow was an unfair barrier to our trade. So in Korea, there were massive, massive street protests with, uh, with farmers and consumers outraged about having to import what they considered a toxic and deadly product. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. I hope that um, one of the things you can see that's going on here is that you can engage right in your home and on your block, and you can engage on a global scale. Um, and one of the things that has been a result of this global assault on our VZBN, right, our right to live well, to eat well, to breathe well, is um, these, these skill shares, right? And so those people who have been maintaining um, gardening, how to eat, how to cook, right? We've got entire generations that have um, been commodified into thinking they've got to order their food. And a return to those traditions has been an empowering movement across the globe. And, um, you know, in Mexico, one of the keys wasn't just the GMOs, it was also banning um, collectively farmed land, which is something that had happened since prior to colonization in Mexico. So that returning to our roots, uh, restoration of indigenous rights, that's another thing that's been um, huge in the resistance to these movements, is um, the indigenous communities and a, and a claim, both through on the street as well as through legislative and policy makers, um, to recognize what are indigenous rights to farm that land. And I think, you know, if you reach back deep enough, we've, we're all connected to that land. So, thank you. We've got a time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Would you like to come up? Thank you. I hope that's not a prepared statement. No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, uh, my name is uh, John Meinick, and I've been interested in these free trade agreements for a long time. Uh, and um, I'm, what I'm curious about is uh, there have been uh, cases where free trade agreements have been defeated. I mean, not merely something like in, um, in Brazil where uh, Lula just said no. Uh, but, you know, popular movements have succeeded. And uh, apparently this is the case in the, uh, in, in the uh, so-called multilateral agreement on investment. I don't know very much about that. And I just wonder whether we have, from any of these successful cases, any lessons to, to be learned that would help us in this fight. Excellent question. Thank you very much. Adam, you want to take a step? Yeah, um, what we've seen, um, where there have been successes in opposing these trade agreements, um, and this is a really, a really critical point, um, we haven't won in Congress. We haven't won in Congress. When these things go to Congress, um, we lose for the obvious reason that our members of Congress are basically bought and, sold repre bought and paid representatives of Exxon and Man Monsanto and Pfizer and... We get Oxford. the pension. Was it? I said we get the pension. <laughs> no, I, yeah. Um, where these things have been stopped is in the negotiating process. When people have raised enough of a ruckus while these things are still being negotiated um, through mass action, 
um, then we've, we've been able, we've had the ability to create enough tension and enough conflict among the negotiators that these agreements have fallen apart. Um, one of the classic examples of that was in 1999 in Seattle, the famous Battle, uh, battle, mm -hmm. battle of Seattle, um, where Say again? Say again. Um, where tens of thousands of people from diverse social movements and, and really for the first time came together in the streets, labor, environmentalists, uh, animal rights activists, food justice activists, AIDS activists, anarchists, um, came together to together say that we, we need to put a stop to global corporate domination and to tell the World Trade Organization that we were not going to allow it to further uh, sell our rights to corporate greed. So there were massive protests. People basically shut down Seattle, and well, the mayor and tear gas helped do that too. But um, but um, yeah, and as it, that what that led to is enough. It created enough tension within the negotiations among some of the developing world countries who uh, realized that they were getting the short end of the stick. Um, that the Seattle round fell apart, and the WTO has really not been able to rehabilitate itself since. I mean, there still is a WTO, but moving it further and further towards the kind of destructive rules that are built into TPP really hasn't happened. Um, and that's been because of uh, vigilance and militancy and strong opposition. Uh, part of the reason things like TPP exist is because this is the U.S.'s end run around their failure at the WTO. So we need, it needs to be met with the same kind of response. Great, great. Um, just to point out, that was maybe the first time in the U.S. that we saw that on a large scale. Certainly not the first time in our global history that we've seen those kind of groups coming together. Amanda, do you maybe have an example, too, of some successful resistance? The one that um, I mentioned around Al Gore. I, mean, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Maybe she has another killer example. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it was lucky, you know, timing's everything. Of course, he was running for election when politicians are at their most vulnerable is when we often see um, our, our wins. But uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, it makes my heart sing. Adam said that, that the bottom line is yeah, direct action, yeah. people on the streets. Ecuador um, is another example. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not familiar. I believe it was 2003. But just negotiations to, and people, I'm sorry. Well, just to say that um, I'm quite sure well, yeah, that that is the reason why these um, meetings are held in secret. Um, it wasn't until after Seattle that they were held in much more uh, um, remote, thank you. Yeah, we went from Davos to, I mean, all, you know. Yeah. And what, the, the last one was moved to Camp David. Was it one negotiation? Just this year there was something happening. I know we'd organized a trip down and it was moved to Camp David. Well, and you know, some of the same forces, they show up at different meetings, right? If it's not the WTO on the one hand, it's the UN Conference on Climate Change on the other hand, and lo and behold, the same corporate advisors are holding our representatives hostage in each place. Qatar, that was another one. Qatar, that's another one. Um, yeah, I just wanted to hold out Ecuador as an amazing example of people coming together when they had negotiations rolled out a mile of opposition and um, marched in and occupied um, their Congress long before our Occupy movement. And um, you know, for the controversial figure that is Rafael Correa, he's certainly a lot better than they had then. And you can see a lot more, at least in rhetoric, in some practice. I know Adam's going to kill me later for holding up Rafael Correa as a good example, but nonetheless, he's <laughs> he, he has improved some. Of the, of the pathway that Ecuador was taking, and that's in large part because of the organized resistance. Well, One more question. Very quickly, in apropos of what Sorry, you've been saying, more. like if we can interfere in the negotiation, negotiating process, we stand a better chance of success. And you mentioned the secrecy of these agreements. So is there a way that we can supersede or find out where these agreements are happening so that we can actually uh, intercede at this point before it's a done deal? It's a great segue. Yep. <laughs> so um, there is currently a $25,000 and growing reward uh, to WikiLeaks for releasing any uh, any leaked texts. You can there's a flyer on the back where you can find out about that and how the reward can be grown. Um, the uh, so that's that's one possibility. Um, another thing is and we're. I don't know too much about the status of this bill. A lot of our allies have, we haven't, we haven't heard that much about it from our allies. There is a bill 
that Senator Ron Wyden has introduced that would demand that members of Congress would have access to these negotiating texts because his own staff couldn't see these things, even though he's the you know, ranking member of the committee that's supposed to be dealing with them. Um, so, um, so that's there a web page that's kind of a clearinghouse where people can go for information and networking? Yeah, I mean, for people, for, if people want to just find out more about TPP, there are some great, great sources of information. One of the pages where a lot of the, the uh, leaks have ended up is citizenstrade.org. That's the website of Citizens Trade Coalition, which is a national coalition of labor and environmental and religious and um, social justice groups um, working against uh, these trade agreements in different parts of the country. Um, citizen, uh, trade, Tradewatch.org is the website of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. Um, the Trade Justice New York Metro, which is the coalition of New York City groups who are working together to stop these trade agreements that we encourage all of you to become part of, um, has a website which is tradejustice.net. Great. Uh, my organization's website is, uh, the, easy w the easy one to remember is freetradekillsanimals.org. And the short domain is gjae.org. Take your pick. Same Great. Website. And maybe you can um, post links to those on the on the wall of the Facebook event. I think we're going to take one more question here in the front, and then we're going to break into uh, some small groups. Do you mind? I have a question for Amanda. Um, you, uh, when you were talking, you said that um, you could get into, um, I guess, sign for the. Uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, and then you were talking about that you could get out, but you can't change the rule. Do you remember that part? Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, but before you give an explanation, I just wanted to say something about what you were talking about, about the factory that it moved to Mexico, the hog factory. But I just, it just reminded me about the, um, what happened in Bangladesh. It's the same situation. We have rules in here, and this manufacturing company, they go to other country where they don't follow rules, they don't have regulations, they make the clothes and then they bring them here. It's the same, it's the same basis, I just want to Thank you for pointing that out. Amanda. Um, yeah, once you've, once the country signed up to the, the partnership, um, then all, all bets are off, nothing can be changed within that partnership and any countries coming in cannot negotiate any addendments to the current partnership. That's all I've got. I did hear Peter mention it in the beginning. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, that pretty, pretty much covers it. That's their concept, scalable, is the word they use for that. In other words, it's just because there's these 11 countries doesn't mean other countries can't join in. And in fact, that's ultimately what they would want. So the idea of, these are the rules, this is it. Don't like it? Too bad. These are the rules. So uh, the whole idea is is everyone will be locked in to this. That's their concept. Everybody will be locked in. There's no escape hatch. There's no mechanism to leave. There's no mechanism to say, well, okay, we'll accept this part, but not that part. And the idea is uh, uh, to bring as many other countries as they can in. And, and just as Amanda just said, what will happen is uh, you want in? Well, these are the rules. You, you can't change it. So uh, NAFTA and a lot of the other trade agreements have the same thing. That's another concept that they brought in with NAFTA. And they brought in that to make these uh, irreversible. Obviously, anything is irreversible. The country, any country could just renounce it and leave. But uh, they usually have a lot of penalties in it. So probably would need you know multiple countries doing that uh, all simultaneously to bring out of it. So they're trying to make not only cement their control, but make their control as permanent as, as humanly possible. Great, great. I just want to point out um, Argentina as an example, right? You guys remember 2003, no, 2001, when uh, the people came together and threw out three governments in a row, right? The Casero Lasso, when they're banging pots and pans in the, in the street. And the subsequent uh, president, also of course a mixed bag, Nestor Kirchner, just simply said no to the World Bank and IMF and to the external debt that the previous administrations had accrued for Argentina and said they were going to do things differently. And uh, lucky for Argentina, there's also a growing force, including um, you know, a, a bank, an international bank that's backed by Venezuela and the oil. Um, industry that's publicly owned there, 
but starting to create these, these um, counter forces to really make it easier for countries to um, go in a different direction and deny the fact that, I mean, that just because their rules say there's no backing out, it doesn't mean that we can't. So thank you very much for the questions so far. Yeah, let's put our hands together for our fabulous panelists. You guys were fabulous. And um, I'm sure there's more questions in the audience. If you guys want to track them down, um, you, can, you can link to them on Facebook. Or if you're no, trying to avoid Facebook, you can talk to them in real life. And before we transition, if I can make a quick uh, pitch. Um, so thank you, those of you who contributed on the way in. And um, just a little bit of an explanation as to um, some of the places that money will be going. Um, and, and maybe this will encourage you to add a little more on the, on the way out. Um, the, a, the kind of actions that you've heard about tonight, um, some of the actions that you've heard about are, are not necessarily cheap. They do cost money uh, to organize. There was a lot, j just recently the TPP had a meeting in Leesburg, Virginia. Um, and during that time, there were a whole range of different actions. Um, there were blockades, there were pukins, there were disruptions of negotiating meetings. Um, there were tamer actions like petition deliveries. Um, people from, from Amanda's organization and some of the other organizations went in, uh, participated in the, one of the few open opportunities to talk to the negotiators and basically called them out on how they're basically selling out people's lives for corporate profits. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ways that we engaged and challenged the TPP. Um, and some of those things were kind of expensive to do. So, and we still have a running debt from doing that. So that's one thing that some of the, that uh, some of the